we look at the forest tradition, and to us it seems very Thai. We forget that when John Munn was alive, he was accused often of not following Thai customs or Lao customs. He followed very closely about the Vinaya, and that required that he not follow a lot of the customs that had developed around village Buddhism in Thailand and Laos. But every time he was accused of not following those customs, he said, the customs of Thailand or Laos or any country are the customs of people of defilements. He was more interested in following the customs of the noble ones. As he said, if you want to become a noble one yourself, you have to follow their ways of doing things. Not be concerned about the customs of the country you come from or your background. You have to be willing to remake yourself in line with the Dharma that rather than trying to shape the Dharma to fit your own ideas. The phrase, customs of the noble ones, appears twice, once in the canon, once in the commentary. In the commentary, it has to do with the story of the Buddha's life. After he came to awakening and had begun teaching, he finally was invited back to his home city. And the day he came back, he went out for alms. Now, people in his family had never gone for alms. He was a member of a noble warrior caste. It was considered disgraceful for a noble warrior to go for alms. And the story in the commentary is that the Buddha's father upbraided him for this, that in their family they had never done that. And the Buddha said, well, I now belong to the family of the noble ones. I follow their customs. So the Buddha had to break with Indian customs, just as a John Munn had to break with Thai customs. Because as we bring that to our own practice, it means we're going to have to break with American customs or European customs or Australian, New Zealand, whatever. We have to look at what's required by the path. This is where the canon's teachings on the customs of the noble ones come in. There are four. The first three have to do with contentment. You're content with whatever clothing you have. For a monk, this means content with your own, <coughs> content with your robes. You're content with whatever food you get. You're content with your alms, alms food. You're content with your shelter. You don't get worked up about trying to improve these things. As you look at what you've got, and you realize it's good enough for the practice. Part of that chant in today's ordination ceremony was the basic supports for a monk. Alms, food, rags, robe. The food of a tree for your shelter. It's not much. What we have here is a lot more comfortable than that. So it means that what we've got here is good enough for the practice. So we focus on that fourth custom and noble one. So you would think that with the first three being food, shelter, clothing, the fourth one would be medicine, but it's not. It's taking delight in developing and taking delight in abandoning. In other words, t taking delight in developing skillful qualities of the mind and delight in abandoning unskillful ones. This is one area where you don't just rest content with what you've got. You're always trying to improve things in the mind. The Buddha himself said part of the secret of his gaining awakening was he didn't rest content with skillful qualities. He kept trying to find out what was more skillful. In other words, you turn your attention away from trying to make your, 
your hut as nice as possible or your robes as nice as possible, or worrying about the food or the diet. Those are not the issues. The issues are the skillful and unskillful qualities in your mind. Now, in addition to being content, the Buddha says you don't exalt yourself or disparage others over the fact that you are content and they are not content with your surroundings. That's the danger that you've got to watch out for. In other words, the fact that you live a simple life is not the goal in and of itself. It's a means. Look at it as your medicine. You've got your illness, you take your medicine. Other people may be ill, and whether they're taking their medicine or not, there's no grounds for you to exalt yourself over them. You don't even exalt yourself over the fact that you're more likely to find delight in developing skillful qualities or abandoning unskillful qualities than other people are. Again, this is medicine for your mind. It's like being in a hospital. Some people take their medicine, other people don't. You feel sorry for those who don't, but you don't exalt yourself for the fact that you're taking your medicine. You've got your disease, they have their diseases. You work on yours. And be very careful that one of your diseases is this tendency to exalt yourself over other people. So always keep that in mind. You look at it in your mind and see what needs developing. Right now it's mindfulness, alertness. You want to be as consistent as possible. And keeping your breath in mind, being alert to the breath, and being alert to what's going on in the mind. Anything that might pull you away from the breath, you've got to be on top of it. Don't let yourself get hoodwinked by it. If you find that you have left the breath, then come right back. You don't have to tie up the loose ends of your thoughts before you leave them and return to the breath. Leave the thought dangling. Leave the loose ends loose. Come right back to the breath. And learn how to use the breath as a means for staying in the present moment. This means taking an interest in the breath, exploring the possibilities of this breath energy in the body. How can you breathe in a way that helps the mind to settle down? How can you think about the breath? What mental image do you have of the breath that makes the breath more satisfying? You can try different ways of thinking about the breath. Think of it coming in and out all your pores. If you find you have a headache, think of the breath energy going down as you breathe in. If you're feeling heavy, think of the breath energy coming up. Take an interest in the present moment, because this is the most interesting part of your life. We tend to measure our life in terms of our plans for the future, our memories of the past. But the way your mind is shaping your life is happening right now, and, you, and this is the only place where you can watch it. So you want to do your best to find something in the present that keeps you interested and keeps you anchored here. So you can watch the processes of the mind and see what really is skillful and what's not. Now these standards are always true. Some people think the idea that there's something unchangeable about the Dharma as being ironic. After all, didn't the Buddha teach all about change? Well, he did teach about change, but he didn't say it was a good thing or a bad thing. It depends on where the change is going. You remember his whole purpose in practicing the Dharma to begin with was to find something that did not change. He saw that he himself was subject to aging, illness, and death. 
He was looking for happiness in other things that were subject to aging, illness, and death. And he realized that this was totally pointless. Is there something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die? That would have to be something outside of space and time. Now, that doesn't mean you have to go to the edge of the universe. Instead, you look inside the mind. Is there a dimension that you can touch within the mind that is unchanging, that doesn't come under space or time? And the Buddha found that there is. That's the most important thing about his life. I've been reading some academic books on Buddhism, and they all talk about how we shouldn't fall for the essentialist fallacy. We shouldn't believe that there's an unchanging essence to the Dharma. But then you have to ask yourself, what do academics know? They can talk about all kinds of things regarding Buddhism, but they can't talk about the Dharma. Their methods can't touch the most important issue about the Dharma, which is, did the Buddha really find a deathless happiness? That, after all, is the essence. He said that's the essence of the Dharma. All Dharmas, he said, have release as their essence. So you have the word of the academics saying that nothing has any essence at all, and you have the word of the Buddha saying that there's, this is the essence of the Dharma. Whose word are you going to take? This is what makes the Dharma valuable, the fact that there is this happiness that can be found through our efforts. This is why we're not concerned about remaking the Dharma in our image, we're trying to make ourselves fit in with the Dharma, to follow the customs of the noble ones that lead to this noble attainment. And it is noble. Harms no one, requires all the good qualities of the mind. That's what makes the human life special, the fact that we can train ourselves to, to reach this. There was a magazine recently that was talking about the different realms that the mind can occupy, the Deva realm. They had a picture of someone meditating in a cabana by a beach, Club Med. In the human realm was a couple in the grass. Now, I would have put that in the animal realm. The human realm, what makes the human realm really good is the fact that you can develop the mind. You can find something really solid worth. The word essence in Pali also means heartwood, like the heartwood of a tree, the part that's really valuable, the part that lasts that you can get the most use out of. That's something about the Dharma that never changes, which is why the customs of the noble ones never change. And we do ourselves a great favor by trying to raise the level of our minds, to take delight in abandoning the unskillful qualities that would prevent that, and to develop the skillful ones that aid in reaching something that really is of true value and true essence. Something worth giving your life to.